Uh, thank you so much, uh, Chief Dana, for joining us here today. I know this is a pre-recorded interview and you have a busy life, so thank you for taking out the time to have this session with us that we can share your, your thoughts, your stories, um, and who you are with the group today. So can you just please introduce yourself and tell us a little bit about why you're here today? Uh, Jintlan Gunzi Shalaknai Bajri Chitnili Dana Tija Tram Ojri. We invite a creator into our discussion today, and I say good day to all of you, all of my relations who are watching here today. And my name is Chief Dana Tija Tram. Thank you so much for joining us. And you know, today's discussion is is looking at Indigenous women, just recovery, and land defense. And these are like really sometimes looking like they're very different issues, but the reality is there's a lot of interconnections. And as an Indigenous leader in your community, can you tell us a little bit about like how just recovery has become an important issue and like where women and land defense play in, a, in the discussion around what a just recovery from this moment of both a climate crisis and a global pandemic, what does that really mean for you? I, I really appreciate the question and I wanted to make time out of my schedule. I, I apologize for not being able to be there live. This is um, an important, if not the most important issue of our day to day. Um, this is a doorway that once we open it, we are led through some of the alternate hallways in the catacombs of history that a lot of uh, the people today, contemporary above ground, don't get access to anymore. There are generations of people in Canada, in North America, and around the world who have simply not had access to the background that the long counters and our memory holders and our wise ones still remember. And just for a bit of context, uh, here in the Yukon Territory in the northwest of Canada, I come from a small community, uh, Teach It, uh, Old Crow, a village 80 miles north of the Arctic Circle, 60 miles east of the Alaska border as the most northwest settlement in Canada. You can almost see the last waves of colonialism that broke on the rocks of my community. Um, about 150 years ago um, is when we first really became into huge contact with the Van Noglet or those who become many among us or, the, or white people. 300 years ago is when we first started making contact with Russians and uh, they were trading with coastal Dinjiju, coastal First Nations, the like Jinikai or Inavaluet, and they would come across the mountains and trade with us. And when we began trading for steel knives and kettle pots, that started changing things because we were a collective rights-based people. Property was owned by the community, not by an individual. And the only way an individual would suffer is if it was the best for the community at large. But then when you started getting steel knives and kettle pots and things that couldn't be really shared openly in a big way, that's when the term property first came into really our, our ways. 150 years into it then came the fur traders. But what's really interesting is with property came the first war. Um, our people uh, began to hold on to our possessions and then we, we began um, military efforts with uh, the uh, Van Noglet in protecting our areas. Um, and I'm sure a lot of people can fill in the blanks, but I mean, quite recently within the past century, um, we had trappers coming to our territory, dumping strict nine into the waterways. Our people would be getting sick. Animals would be uh, killed uh, in mass. And um, it was very hard for us to really uh, fathom this. It was a complete alternative to our whole way of system and our way of thinking. Now, um, where this really comes in is we can look all the way back to the Industrial Revolution with uh, uh, Descartes and Galileo, who are the fathers of the mechanized philosophy. And then you add in a dash of Adam Smith with the Wealth of Nations as the first economist. And together you get this really sterile, compartmentalized, separate, divided, over to dominate worldview. Whereas indigenous peoples 
We lived with systems. And that was what was so difficult for us to understand with our white brother when they were coming. We had the, the gold rush in 1898. But we have to remember, at about the same time as Jack the Ripper in Whitechapel, London of 1887, there was maybe 300 white people in the Yukon. And with the gold rush came the first influx of about 11,000 people. And there was probably about six to 9,000 First Nations in the Yukon at this time. So we simply got overwhelmed. But what was one of the most key uh, difficult issues for us to coordinate and collaborate with our white brother was property and was the owning of land. It, it simply did not exist. And we could not understand how to work with our partner because they would sell land for a quick buck and they would cultivate the land, industrialize it, and um, really work the land hard and the animals. And for instance, some observation from our people at that time is that we, didn't, we couldn't understand that because we managed resources so that those resources would always be there. If you left that creek alone where you saw a moose standing, that moose would be there for your children, their children, and their children. We, we were fine that way. But through Canada, and we were basically bribed with housing and welfare and jobs, but we didn't get anything from it. We never got rich. We never got anything sustainable. We were given table scraps. And a lot of us as Indigenous people left the bush to go pursue these glittering prizes that really all it did was lead us into a myriad, into a maze in which we powered a colonial system that we just simply didn't understand. But it actually had inverse reflections on our culture as well. Um, and this exchange has never really happened in, in, in its conclusion in the sense that with the 1492 um, uh, meeting of South American uh, First Nations and Christopher Columbus, you have the Columbian exchange. Uh, there was many pathogens brought over, uh, lots of different concepts and some different plants and same thing vice versa. Uh, there was uh, tomatoes, squash, potatoes, all came from the First Nations. So there was this big exchange they called the Columbian Exchange. But this is still waiting for since 1492, as well as with the meeting of the Van Noglet and the Dingy Zhu up in our territory, what our people still remember to this day is this exchange is still not finished. Our indigenous perspectives and values although they do not neatly fit in the quantifications and relax themselves in the academias that are pushed up upon us, they can still inform them. And I, I still ask people today, why cannot major paradigm shifts in economic principles not come from a humble people in my village? Why can we not be harbingers of, of major movements forward in sustainability, in copability, in, in society. In fact, as Indigenous people, we've been holding on to truths for a very, very long time. And we've been waiting for our white brother to listen um, and until our voice is actually um, equal to that of our white brother. That is the only time we will have a conversation because the moment you enter into a conversation as a lesser, which as we know was prominent in the 70s and even 100 years ago, that's a given. But it's a lot more nuanced today. And indigenous peoples are not what we're actually after. We're not after lawsuits. We're not after court cases. We are, are looking for cultural change. And that's the same thing with Black Lives Matter and many movements around the world. But the, the real difficult thing and where contemporary colonial society really does have and has perfected colonization is that we are only afforded negotiation tables or courtrooms. And that is in their laws on their basis. We have never to this day been met as equal partners even though um, that's what we had promised in, in, in the very forethought. So um, to bring this full circle, how this really corresponds to 
the equalization of women and that definition through land justice is actually a perfect conduit. Now, um, men and women were seen as equals in our society, but we did have different jobs. But there was no one person who was, you know, had a hierarchy than than another unless situations warranted it, unless, you know, there was going to be a hard winter or or something of that nature. But um, when we look at identities, and this is extremely important, and, and just bear with me because I... I found a very interesting correlation when you look at, we have to ask ourselves, and I'm not pointing people out to make people uncomfortable. And I realize that every time you point a finger, there's three fingers pointing back at you, but we have to ask ourselves, why are over 80%, up to 87% of the serial killings that happen in North America, why are almost 90% of them white males from the age of 25 to 35? There is a reason for this, and I don't believe that there's something inherently in um, white culture or white people that bring this out. In fact, it's the society that pulls this out, because in Indigenous society, we recognize an individual for how they self-identify themselves, and we weave them into our society opposed to what we have in contemporary colonial society where it is not, it doesn't matter how you identify yourself. There is a preconceived compartmentalized space that you have to contort yourself to fit in to drive their system because their only sense of power is through money or status. It's not actually the breadth of your ethos you know, how, how great you are in, in poetry, unless you can sell it or unless you can get up to these higher degrees. So what we have here is the natural disposition of a human being now having to seek external externalities for their own um, well-being and value system. And that's really dangerous when you have to reach outside of yourself to validate what's happening inside of yourself. So really, um, there are new theories today talking about a lot of these new serial murders, which only account for about 7% of all homicides in North America, are actually sociopathy and psych- uh, psychopathy, and they are punishing society. It is society that does not understand them, that overtly pressures them, and so it's this thwart back and attack. So let's take this and i don't have the time to to get into the intricacies of this which i obviously would love to do but let's really just take this and and let's flip it towards females when we over sexualize and over commodify women we devalue them on a very large degree and a very large stake now indigenous peoples were religious peoples and we were very spiritual people In fact, it was only through the vehicle of my culture that afforded me a very specific and different outlook on space and time. And I allowed me to actually kind of third person look at my life and experience myself as a spirit having a human experience, not the other way around. And when you do that, it eliminates these mortal boundaries and you're actually able to be a part of all things once you can eliminate this fear of death. So let's bring this over to the women. Women were seen as co-creators because it was creator that chose woman to bring life into this world, not man. The, The bleeding of the woman was seen as a sacred thing and time and that signal of being a co-creator with creator men's blood was different because that was done in war, that was done in hunting. And so what we have here is in indigenous cultures, and you have to admit, living 80 miles north of the Arctic Circle, when it gets minus 60 out, you don't have a lot of convenience to make up a lot of, you know, mental platitudes about how the world works. No, if you're going to survive, you cannot mess around. And there is a very important concept, and and one that I find is that there are three types of truth. There is a personal truth, a political truth, 
and then an objective truth. Indigenous peoples did not have the convenience to politicize objective truths. We certainly, we merely um, positioned ourselves around objective truths. And this is how we informed ourselves. And what's really interesting is that our society really embraced and wrapped itself around women because women were such a, a powerhouse. They were the spinal cord of the family unit, but also of the communal unit. So what will really kind of wipe the slate clean for a lot of people here today is that we didn't understand the term chief, or in our language, chitnili. Um, actually, our original word for the chief was uh, a, to, a well-to-do person. It was someone who put themselves forward for better coordination of our hunting and our nomadic lifestyles. But more interestingly enough, any time our people stopped in their nomadacy, the eldest woman of our group was automatically the one who coordinated and was basically Chitnili, big boss. Um, and that went towards uh, maternality and, and all of these wonderful things. And there, there's great stories as well of the older women um, actually having basically being like the rule of law and and the chief was actually a little a little bit less under those women and it's actually still alive today i grew up among strong guchin women and and that certainly certainly made me and there was a complete perversion in this system when for instance indian agents came to our area and to our land and they said you know what we're not going to speak with you women. Go get a man and we will talk to them. So the first chiefs in our areas were actually puppets. And it was the older women that were telling the men what to say. And they would go sit down with the Indian agents. But let's take a pause button for a second here. Now, where was this coming from? Now, at what point were these Indian agents and these colonial males really communicating to indigenous peoples. And these are two completely diametrically opposed systems, and they still are today. Um, it doesn't matter what, what is said. And I hear a lot of people championing Canada for you know, all of these wonderful things, but I, I really would um, advocate members here taking a look at the Indian Act here in Canada, which is over 150 years old now. And the apartheid in South Africa actually designed their systems off of Canada's residential and their Indian Act system. Out of 634 First Nations in Canada, there's only about 26, 27 nations who have left the Indian Act. This is abhorrent. There is no excuse for this, no matter what. And our people are still being denigrated in a legislative Bastille that not only atrophies our self-determination, but it actually has polluted our political systems, our objective truth systems, and our personal truth systems. All of this to say, full circle back, the way that we are going to rise up is the empowerment, of course, empowerment of our men and empowerment of our elders and empowerment of our children. But we have to be honest here and look at the keystone in the complexity of the woman's role within our societies. And it was that, women, that woman when her, the weight of creation that she created, which had spiritual social, military, and survival and biological effects in our society that we well understood. It was the female that was delicately placed that held together the buttresses of all of our inner workings that tied everything together. But I would like to also um, juxtapose this with the European system because at certain points, European systems came from this as well with their paganism. Um, women, it wasn't until the third dynasty in Egypt that the Pharaoh declared himself Amun-Ra, the god of God. But before then, it was the queen whom she married became Pharaoh. And this is also likened to the Druids of Scotland and so on and so forth. But this changed 
And what's really interesting, and I, and I, I could do a whole nother segment on this, but if you are going to dominate your area, if you're going to defend your land, and if you're going to um, attack and defend in military, it actually all boils down to women. If you control women and you control birth, which is in those days almost a 50-50 thing. I mean, if you could perfect childbirth and on top of that subjugate women as a ruler, as a monarch, on top of a hierarchy of a society, you have warriors, you have military, you have, you have control. And it was women. And that's what I find very interesting when the Council of Nancia, about 3,000 white men who decided what was going to be in the Bible, and when you have that translation that Eve came from the rib of Adam, when the actual language that was written in the original scrolls, it, the word didn't mean just rib, it also meant half, half or rib. Imagine if Eve had come from half of Adam. That would, I mean, I get goosebumps just saying it, it would be a paradigm shift in society. But we know about the warmongering and the huge... Um, upheavals and monarchs and and so on and so forth all of this to say the subjugation of women is in the interest of over militarized dominant men that's where we get these things from and actually societies that relax and yes they may not have um, specialization that leads to compartmentalization in civilizations or in societies, major societies, like I'm talking Rome, because in 1492, in the city of Tinochin on Lake Titicaca, was actually the most complex city and highly populated in the world, that's 1492, and those are indigenous peoples. But what I'm trying to stress is that as a people that lived with the land, who turned the land or the universe into their university, instead of going to a university to learn about the universe. One thing that's interesting is we could not understand as indigenous peoples, we were the masters of our own time. We decided when we did things and how we did them. And it was really hard for us to understand the introduction with white men that we saw him as being mastered by time. So when our society had that place and that space and time to configure ourselves around the objective, objective truths, which is purely in land, that protection of land, the protection of resources for uh, continuity and in perpetuity for all of our generations, women quickly rose to uh, a high point of, of reverence, of work, but um, their position in our societies were exactly that, a keystone and something that we recognized. You know, like, wow, like there's just so much in there in this like history where we've unwoven, like you've just like brought us through colonization and the implications that colonization not just had like on like putting us on reserve systems and all of these things, but like how it changed the value systems and the, and the ways in which we didn't just relate to, to the land, but to economics, to our, mm -hmm. our, you know, our, our neighbors, to our genders, and how all of these complex things were extinguished through colonization, largely through a set, a, a purpose of commodification and capitalism, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. And so we're in this time right now where we are like struggling as a species on this planet to find solutions to this climate crisis. And as we're bumbling through, and we have so many indigenous communities, like not just in, in so-called Canada or, or North America, but the globe, like the, the world over, that have been like pushing forward these these um, these systems that existed for millennia um, as potential avenues to explore as alternatives to structures that have only been inherently in place for a few hundred years, a few centuries. And mm -hmm. there's such a disregard because of what you said that completely different opposing, diametrically opposing structures. It's like 
it's like going, it wasn't just a language barrier. It was complete diametrical value systems of our societies that didn't understand. That's why our treaties in Canada don't make sense to our native folks versus like the, the settler colonial society. We had diametrically opposing um, perspectives mm -hmm. and views of what those meant. So now we're in the society, capitalism abound everywhere, commodification of everything. And we have this global pandemic that's sort of been stacked on top of this climate emergency. And we are now like dealing with crippling, falling apart economic structures. And we are talking about how do we not just like recover our economy, but how do we recover from the, the economy while simultaneously addressing the climate crisis, while simultaneously addressing centuries of, of marginalization and oppression and, and essentially attempted forms of genocide against indigenous peoples. So like thinking about that, what does a just recovery actually look like right now? Like you've given us this history, but what is the solution? What is the future, a just recovery future for you really look like? I think it involves um, a lot of gasoline and a book of matches. No, 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 I'm joking, I'm joking, I'm joking. But, um, you know, I, I, I really appreciate um, um, your uh, summary as well. And, you know, as we stand on the precipice of these huge eclipsing ideas in this conversation, it's, I find that, Sometimes as we wander into complex landscapes, we still have to be guided by the simple constellation of our principles. And that's what's most important here. And so now to answer your question, we actually have to back up out of this conversation a little bit and, and re-engage from an Indigenous point of view. And, um, you know, first of all, I, I do have to say as well, it's it's an honor for for me to be able to address all these people here today. And if you get a your hair stands up on the back of your neck a little bit, if things are hard to hard to hear a little bit, that's good. That's that's good. That's where that's where learning happens, and and we all get that. And and also the other thing is is don't go to those dark places where we hate our society and we feel like you know we're, we're not going to get through these things. We we absolutely are, and we have many times over and I get so frustrated you know why in our countries are our pockets always empty for moral issues why is it that we can find uh, a billion dollars for the COVID-19 virus yet there are communities in Canada indigenous communities without drinking water who have never had this why is it that we can write blank checks for wars but yet when it comes to um, missing and murdered Indigenous women and girls or um, assisting Indigenous peoples uh, out of the Indian Act that, you know, we just put our hands up in the air and say, oh, well, it's, it's really complex. And where did our bravery go? Where did our courage go? How can a president of the United States stand up to a podium with no idea how and say, we're going to the moon in 10 years, but yet here comes climate change and everyone's like, oh, well, you know, this is, this is a little bit too much. Here's, here's the point at the end of the day. If the ways of indigenous ways of knowing are quite simply, imagine your life as a house, okay? Now, if you fear your death and if you're told that this is the only thing that you'll ever have, it actually really drives capitalism. What does anything matter if you're just going to die and you have no responsibility anymore whatsoever? So if you come to this house, remember here in life, we don't remember where we came from. We don't know how we got here. We're, we're just here. And then we have no evidence of what happens afterwards. It's probably none of our business. But the point of the matter is if you come to this house and you're told, okay, this is your only time here. You're never coming back. There's no accountability you're going to have a house party. You're going to smash the windows for some kicks. You're going to have your fun. You're going to leave. But with the indigenous ways of knowing everything is a circle, there is no leaving and there is no arriving. There's just movement and there's just cycles. So when we look at existence, we come to this house and we know that we're going to come back to this house or our children are going to come to this house. So it has to be left how we found it exactly how we approach it is exactly how it has to be when we leave. 
So you're right. We look at the Industrial Revolution, just look at the charts. The world populations skyrocketed. So did emissions. This is the first time where we actually see a major destabilization in, um, in every sector, agriculture, economics, industrialization. I mean, children didn't have rights at that time. But look at it this way. The moment you depart from holistic human-based thinking and our economies, our, um, our governing systems, our law systems, they cannot breathe, they cannot dream, they are systems that compartmentalize human beings that we drive these systems. During the Nuremberg trials, when they were trying some of the guards at Auschwitz, and um, basically they were like, okay, well, why should we not sentence you to, to death? And, and, and the guard said, look, I, I didn't do anything. I was just following orders. Well, we can look back at that and say, well, that's a cop-out. What are our children going to say at the end of the century, when we did not get 1.5 degrees, when oceans have re risen by 14 meters, when, when every system becomes destabilized, they're going to look back at us and what are we going to say? Oh, well, I, I was just following orders. That, that is not good enough. That is, there is no excuse. But then let's go back to that industrial revolution and let's look to what they did to the land. It was homogenization and it was monoculture that destroyed the land. In South America, each village had their own potatoes and they created this wonderful furrow system that was just manipulated the, the temperatures by a couple of degrees. Oh, I wish I could go off on them. But anyways, it, it was a perfect system. When Christopher Columbus had come over, um, as Charles C. Mann writes in his book, 1491, the potatoes that they took back were maybe about five or six strains. And he said it was like dipping a teaspoon into an ocean of genetics. And they brought this little sample back over to Europe. And it actually was a very nutritious food and more so than anything they had access to. But look what one potato blight did to Europe after they depended on it. Look what it did to Ireland. If they had fomented variety and, and banked on diversity and rewarded cooperation, they would have been in an ecologically much stronger position. But by homogenization, by monoculture and industrialization and looking at the earth as something to be dominated for our pure enjoyment was hubris and is hubris to this day. And it is the same thing as we liken to our mothers. You know, they, they give and they give and they give. And, and we take and we take and we take. But there becomes a moment of maturity when we must become independent and when we realize this. And with Indigenous peoples, again, it wasn't quantified by some age, the age of majority. Okay, you're 18, you're an adult now, go out into the world. No, our idea of adulthood is when an individual could meet adult responsibilities. Now, look at the time we are in right now. This is a heyday for corporations. There are bigger executive payouts. There is more affluence than there has ever been in any time in human history. Um, with some of the starvations that are happening around the world, we have enough food to feed everybody. It's not a food problem, it's a distribution problem. So where and what is that distribution hinged on? And the point of the matter is, is again, it comes back to women. If we respect this earth as our mother, and be careful about those words, never mind the words, let's get into that emotion. What part of ourselves are separated from this planet? What part of us did not come from here? Even the simple notion, and we can measure the argon in an exhalation and towards the mathematics of how gases diffuse, one of your exhalations will become part of the entire atmosphere within 10 years. And how many times are you breathing? And the trees are breathing that in as well. And actually, we can't tell the difference of where a human begins and air ends. 
It's brought into the tributaries of your lungs, dis distributed to red platelet cells, and the organelles in your cells breathe them again. And it, it, it's this beautiful synergy where there actually isn't these over quantifications in colonial sciences. Existence is a long fiddle. It is not the precise keys of a piano, if you will. So here's the other point, the last tool that will is the keystone to, to change is that, look, the economies and all of these systems we built, they work. They do exactly what they've been designed to do, and they do it well. But you have to be careful because it was wheat that domesticated man in the Fertile Crescent. It wasn't the other way around. We have to be very conscious of the tools that we wield because they wield us back. And we have to remember who is wielding the tool and why. A gun is not evil. It is good when you point it at an animal that will feed your family and give that respect and understand it. It is evil when you point it at another human for some shallow reasons. And these are the teachings that there are in my community. I, I saw an eight-year-old touch a gun and his grandfather turned around right away and said, don't touch that. He said, every time you touch that rifle, something's going to die. And that's all he said. And he turned around and right there, the child was able to um, go over and realize that, no, this is not a toy, that this is something of death and death is something very big, very large. So let's look at the tool of this economy. Right now, our economy is a gun, but we're pointing it at other countries and we're pointing it at animals we don't need. Our family is fed well enough. So. When it comes to the gross domestic product, which our economies are based on, show me the evidence where the higher a country's GDP is, the happier a family unit is. Show me the studies that the more money that you have, the more vibrant and happier your life is. I'm very interested in this. And it goes all the way back to Adam Smith in The Wealth of Nations, where he said, no dog would share its bone with another dog. That study's, actually been, that study's actually oh. been done. That study's actually been done, and they've proven that while the gross domestic, uh, you know, the GDP has grown tremendously across the countries, and they actually started to look at the GDP to look at like healthy, happy countries, um, and they measured it just after the depression. And as the GDP rose, happiness mm -hmm. rose, and they started to say, "Oh, see." When the GDP rises, we're happy. But what has actually happened is the GDP continues to rise globally. And the, the human happiness index has like basically flatlined and sometimes dips down. And we're not actually seeing any growth in the human happiness index. And I learned this at an ecological economics conference uh, with a group called CANSI. And they've done some amazing work to look at how like we have this fallacy of these systems and structures mm -hmm. where we are doing exactly mm -hmm. what you said. You know, we are we yeah. are pointing, we are using a gun to build an economy and we're pointing it at each other as a way to try to build something. We are wielding the wrong tools. Exactly. And, and just quickly to close off on that thought, and, and you brought up a really important point that uh, kind of fired something in my head is when I talked about the indigenous perspective and when we talk about the quantifications in colonial society, look, those, their tool making abilities are very powerful. The gun did amazing things for my people, but we can teach them how to use it. And that's these principles. Look, even in quantum physics now we know, we can measure down to the 14th decimal place in an atom to Planck's constant where things beyond that just get really strange. But are we living better lives? This is the real point. And here's, here's where the real crux comes. And I've, all, I've thought about this quite a bit. Wouldn't it be so convenient if all of the issues in this planet were somebody else's fault? In fact, this planet is a mirror and it is directly and equally reflecting any displacement that is happening with the carbon emissions, 
that is off-putting and destabilizing ecologies around the world is a perfect balanced inflection of the imbalance of our perception in how we've approached our environments and how we've approached this world. It actually has everything to do with us and where our value systems are and what we choose to promote and what we choose to ignore. And all of the ancient indigenous shaman around the world will tell you that there is no such thing as good or evil. That in fact, both of these dualities are needed for existence. That one is not to be defeated and the other to win. They are to be experienced. And even through thermodynamics, we know that electricity or energy travels from the positive to the negative. That's a, a fundamental precipice of our, of our third dimension. So why is it that human beings have the hubris to all of a sudden say, no, we're going to operate on a totally different way. There's going to be no negativity. We're not going to address it in a constructive way. We are going to ignore it and suppress it and just hijack this positivity. We're just going to get, we just want everything to be awesome all the time. Everyone's going to be affluent. The GDP is just going to keep growing. Everything is going to keep, what that is, is an insecurity, an existential insecurity of pain and even trying to escape um, death. And this is where the, the luxuries and the distractions truly come and where especially attaching an arbitrary value base to that um, has allowed for these hierarchies that, that obviously do not serve the, the lower classes of people. And we can look through history, we can, we can see this on the news, we can do these things um, on, on mass scale, but the answer has always been with ourselves and our relationships with one another and the earth. And a big one is, and especially today, you can see this in the perversion and our relationship with women. Men have a really big problem today. And this is speaking as a male as well. Partially, some of it has to do with a lack of ceremony anymore. There is no recognition of the individual. The only ceremonies we practice in today's society is when you graduate from high school or when you graduate from college and you wear this little hat and you, know, you throw it in the air and, and everyone goes home. But where's the recognition into manhood that comes to a or womanhood that says to an individual, okay, you are joining this society and these are our values. How are you going to coordinate yourself with that? When I look at um, uh, a lot like even TV today, this hypersexualization is being brought on by very, very young girls as well too. And I do have to say, that there is something that I've never heard anybody talk about, but it's these uh, texting pictures to one another. And this is happening in high schools where young kids are, are texting inappropriate pictures to one another. And this is happening at younger and younger ages. And it's happening now and it's, it's happening all across the world, but, but nobody's really talking about it. And what I really worry about, because I grew up in the 90s when, you know, a pager was like the big thing. And uh, I mean, now we have these abilities and informed from larger societal um, values, which are communicated through movie posters, through commercials, through this sexualization of women is, is everywhere. And what does that communicate to children? And when their interactions even at these younger ages, are coming through these sexualized, sexualizing of, of young women at that very young age, how that perverts their, their, their growth into maturity is extremely troublesome. And it is the biggest red flag that I have seen recently. It is a canary and a coal mine. You know, um, at the end of the day, over... Um, the, the sex issue, it should, this should be one of empowerment. We should be empowering one another as individuals. 
we should be, and, and we've always had this ability. We've always had this power. Uh, if, if we want to be moving forward, it's about the empowerment of the individual, which is interesting because we're in such a society of disempowerment. Your only connection to power is what's in your bank account. Your only connection to status is what your job position is, what, what your house is, the make of your car, and it goes on and it goes on and it goes on and on. You know what? We don't have to run by these banking systems. The real solution to moving forward are, is the return of the community. You know, in the 1920s, every community in the United States, they had their own dairy farm, their own seamstress, all of this. And it, it only became through uh, major industrialization and uh, mechanization where cities really started to come about and the kids were leaving the farms and going over to this. It's actually, we have the power to create a synergy and a balance between both. And what that really looks like are communities coming together and creating co-ops and unionizing and, and coming together around their electives. This um, division that runs through, and you can see it as well on the internet, we leave our neighbors alone and we search for our communities on computers to find other people with like and views because we are so alienated from one another. So really, where are these principles? Because as indigenous peoples, it was the pressure of survival that galvanized our arcs, the arc of our society as an arc is stronger with weight on it. And I tell you, if that came back today in modern civilization, people would fall apart. How civil are people going to be in New York when food stops becoming, when food stops being delivered and, and all of the rest? It's returning back to our foundation as natural peoples and respecting for the roles of the objective truths we position ourselves around. It's like moving that whole like value system. It's like moving, you know, we saw the, the erasure, both like physical and, and historical, like we lost our histories for a really long time of that collective mm -hmm. um, uh, process in which is natural to humanity. Like, like you said, the, the, the key to survival belonged in our collective natures. I actually think that climate change is forcing us and even this pandemic, mm -hmm. like the, the global pandemic forced the world to start looking as a collective as opposed to, you know, Europe versus, you know, Russia mm -hmm. or Canada versus the United States. We started looking at humans. We started looking at our communities mm -hmm. and how our communities inter interconnected. And I think what's really interesting is it's not just about this human centric ideology around how nature actually you know, moves us. Like we weren't nomadic because we were simply like nomadic, but we were moving with the natural laws of, of, the, of the land, of the river systems, of the weather patterns, um, which actually brought forward that biodiversity. And we always think of biodiversity mm -hmm. as trees and plants and even an other animals that exclude humanity. But one of the things I've really learned over the years that I feel like I heard these tenets in your, in your, um, and what you were talking about was that biodiversity is so critical for the planet, but biodiversity mm -hmm. is not subjective or just like belongs to other species that are not human. Humans are so diverse. We belong like mm -hmm. potatoes. There are so many varieties of us and each one tenders the land and attaches to those places where it's nurtured and brings forward different types of nitrates and, and, and you know, nutrients to the land. And like we need the biodiversity and colonization brought with it hyper individuality and also this homogenization grounded in systems of white supremacy. And it has mm -hmm. resulted in this destabilization. And what's beautiful to hear you speak about is that we're not talking about just indigenous ideology. These are human ideologies that were the foundations mm -hmm. of humanity. And that a just recovery isn't simply about like, how do we fix the economic system? Because like you said, it's doing exactly what it was intended to do. It's about shifting our ideological perspectives and looking at what does it mean to be human 
on this planet? And who are those that are still holding on to those tenants of understanding our roles and responsibility? It is those that are still hearing the language of our lands. It's those that are still listening to the wisdom of our elders that is not extracted and put into a book, but is literally tactile, experiential, and, and really tangible. It is not something that can come in and shift away. It's something that's like lived experiences. And as someone who is like Dene from the North, I know that like, it doesn't matter. Like time is, is, is so irrelevant because it is mm -hmm. really about what happens. I remember trying to set up interviews with, with folks from the North, including yourself, where like things shift, the community shifts and it's not about being driven and, and you know, imprisoned by time but it's being driven by the community as opposed to this concept of a clock or a date. And it's so challenging yeah. to work with reporters and other people to be like, we want to set up these interviews at these certain times. When should we go? And I'm like, that's a tricky question. It's really going to depend on where the community is flowing in that moment. And you have yeah. to be able to be flexible. And I think that's a beautiful lesson on understanding how we have to move in what these new futures look like. They have to be flexible and they have to bend and move with community. And they have to recognize the diversity of the roles of men and women, young and old, and all yeah. the dynamics of in between. And that is like, just like this, just recovery is more than just about putting up solar panels and fixing the economy. Yeah. It's about yeah. a fundamental paradigm shift. Yeah. And it's such and a beautiful thing. You, you hit it right on the head. And I have a name for it. I call it the psychokinetic disease. Because a parasite enters an organism and makes the organism crave what the parasite needs. And that organism is re rewarded for doing that. You know, studies show that a nine month year old, or sorry, a nine month old baby can understand the, when the last of its digestive cookies are there. And it will still give the last digestive cookie to another baby. This is the beginning of our psychologies, and, and this is what babies do. So a baby is not born racist, they're not born sexist, they are taught those things. The Greek, um, referred to a baby as tabula rasa, which means blank slate. So imagine every new brain, every new mind as a Petri dish. We are infecting these new Petri dishes with ancient old diseased forms of thinking. This separation between us and the environment, this separation between us and one another. And it's almost like, you know, that, that when people were drowning in the, in the Titanic, some people would push other people under the water just to be able to breathe for a second. And that's what we're doing in our economies. We are drowning and we are pushing third world countries and others under the water so that we can relax on top of them while they are struggling for their lives. So if we want to talk about just transition, that world will reflect the world that our ancestors dreamed of when we get real about our own biases, when we do the psychokinetic surgeries on ourselves. And that over leadership, over innovation, right now we need courage. It is only going to be courage that will forge the generations. And for non-Indigenous peoples listening, for Europeans, you can begin this and begin it with your story. Begin it about where you came from. I can go um, 30,000 years into the past with our oral history. And that is a technology because I'm not afforded the hubris that could come from individuality, that I am just this. No, I'm actually a tiny twig on top of this ancient, ancient tree that's been reaching out. And there's a trajectory. It's actually our community as indigenous people is not just here now, it's interdimensional. It's, or sorry, it's interchronological. We have, we have, I have a relationship with my grandchildren who are not born. I, I, I am in the trenches every day up to my neck in mud for them. And I was given the strength by my, grand, by my mother, her mother and her mother before him. And I know all of their stories. So that is like, a, a chiropractic that snaps me into a place. Begin your stories. Take your sovereignty 
over your mind and over yourselves. And let's start calling out the preconceived um, conveniences for GDPs, even legal systems and all of these systems. These systems are not us. They are the Auschwitz death camp that we hold guard for. And we don't have to do it. But the problem is, the problem is this. During the Soviet Union, when the Soviet Union was rising, they were promising this is going to be a whole new way of life. There's going to be affluence. There's going to be all of this. And we have this um, issue that can serve as a weapon against us of normalization or hyper-normalization in groupthink in societies. Well, while the Soviet Union was falling, the leaders were still making the same promises and the people, the, the society, the voting members, they were totally disillusioned. They knew that it wasn't going to be and they knew that it couldn't happen, but nobody could envision an alternative. And that's actually the same thing I'm seeing in the United States right now. Their president is making all of these promises, all of these, but and I think that a lot of people just know and they can feel the violence of how much of an illusion the system is. It's not serving anyone except for the 1%. But who in the Americas can envision an alternative? Who has that alternative? I'll tell you that the indigenous peoples have been waiting very patiently for a long time. And we've been holding on to truths since before the first inklings of the Indo-European languages. My people were coordinating and living into the up to the hundred thousands in one of the most inhospitable environments in the world. There are truths and principles that the land has taught us that we still retain and remember today. And we are waiting for our brothers to re-enter the circle into us. And in, on closing on that thought, I just want to empower people here that nothing that I've said here today has, is mine. If anything that has been said rings a bell of truth, think of it like the fish that come from the ocean and fight their way up a river to spawn in a spawning bed in one of the most sacred concepts in our language we call ni'inli, which would take pages to describe, but it's a, it's a fundamental function of the universe of renewability. But in any case, truths in your experience, empower yourself by seeing the truths that have found you have been fighting their way to you this entire time to spawn in your mind, to give rise to the next generation that will come back to affect the ocean or our external environments. And the other thing is, is basically it's about taking sovereignty over information. But another side is, is that we, the Vantat Guchin, it, Guchin are the people of, and it means the people of the many lakes. Uh, out to the east, you have the Tetla J Guchin, the people of the headwaters. Well, when we had first met white people, we called them Chuck J. Guichin, the people who dwell under stone because of the brick houses that they built and the stone houses that they built. So for the non-Indigenous people watching, you're Guichin too, and I'm Guichin too. My wife, who's from Singapore, I call her uh, Gay Ha'ai Guichin, the people of the sunrise. We are all people. We are all in this together. And there's only one thing that is going to get us out of this corner that we've put ourselves in. And that is disregard these political truths because I have seen climate change destabilize international tables. I was there at the Arctic Council when Mike Pompeo came up and denied climate change. This is a baseline for indigenous peoples. So that's where the conversation starts with indigenous peoples. So. Be very weary of political truths. They are conveniences. And concentrate on the objective truths that inform your personal truths and have that courage to be honest with yourself and with each other about this. And that is when we'll start making the shift. And this is where um, we move forward together, empowering each other and the courage and the objective truths. 
Thank you so much, uh, Chief Dana. It's, this has been such an amazing conversation. Um, it, I just wanna wrap up by saying like, having you here is just such a wealth of knowledge. This is going to be broken up. Um, and so there, I'm gonna turn this into a longer piece that I will share with the, with the participants. But uh, this is just a snippet for those on this webinar. Hopefully you'll listen to the full version with Chief Dana. It's been such a great conversation. Um, a lot of what you wrote, talked about with the disease of the mind reminds me of a really great um, Native American author named Jack Forbes and a book called Columbus and Other Cannibals. It was written in 1974 or six. It is literally one of the foundational books for me. Um, and I encourage you all to read it because it really talks about how this disease of the mind with an, he, was, he comes from Algonquin heritage. He talked about how uh, we've been stricken with the Witigo disease or a disease of cannibalism. Um, which is really exactly mm -hmm. what you were talking about. And so, so grateful for, for taking the time today. And I will share this recording with you as well. Um, but thank you, Masi Masi Cho. And also just, uh, you, you're, you're Gwich'in, I'm Dene, or Dene Sotlene. And our people are also like, I'm Kaikale Dene Sotlene, which is people of the willow. And our name means just people of like of the land we are just of the land and we have sort of designations mm -hmm. for all of the different regions uh, and where we come from and i'm the willow people and so like everyone is dene i remember my my aunt saying that one everyone's dene they're all from the land and we <laughs> have that in a lot of our indigenous cultures is that we don't own indigeneity but indigeneity encompasses a value systems of that collective identity that isn't just an ad identity that, um, that ends at humanity, but encompasses the whole entire natural world. And we welcome mm -hmm. you into that cosmology and that ideology of what it means to be indigenous as we talk about what it means to work towards a just recovery and a reconcile mm -hmm. of what it means for women to be leaders in our society and why land defense becomes so critical to achieving all of those things. So thank you so much, Chief Dana, um, and I'm going to end the recording now.